You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show. Rated the number one podcast of all time. Of all time. Oh. Make sure you're ready because this is the podcast where you are guaranteed to learn virtually everything. Well, today's episode is brought to you by Squarespace, which is an all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. And for a free trial and 10% off, all you have to do is go to squarespace.com and use the offer code CALLEN8. I don't use Squarespace personally, but my friend does, and I have a couple other friends that do as well. And And I just watched my friend actually create a bunch of websites. I think he created like five websites in an hour. And what was amazing was how easy it was for him to do it. And just how many features and designs they offer. I mean, you can really create your own experience and make it very, very unique. So, you know, I I actually really believe in the product. I I don't let anybody, I will not take on any sponsor I don't believe in. Um, But what's cool about this is it really, it really makes it very easy for the everyday layman like myself to create their own website. And if you have trouble, they've got staff on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and, and they can help you. And by the way, it's really cheap. It starts at like $8 a month and includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. Um, and, and every design automatically includes a unique mobile experience that matches the overall style of your website. So your content will look great uh, on, on pretty much all, all your devices, which is pretty cool. So you can t- bring it up on your phone, on your iPad, whatever it might be. Uh, and the other thing is that they're always improving their platform with new features and new designs and even better support. You know, uh, and So uh, I have to say it's a, it, it's a pretty cool company and more and more people are using it and um, look I'm, I'm happy to be doing it I guess you can actually start a trial you don't need a cre- you don't need a credit card uh, you you can just you know contact them and they've got all different kinds of options so make sure you use the uh, offer code calinate to get 10% off and uh, start creating your own websites you don't have to pay somebody crazy money for it now Squarespace makes it possible for you to create your own online experience that's unique and beautiful. For a free trial and 10% off, all you have to do is go to squarespace.com and use the offer code CALLEN8. All right, everybody, this is the uh, Brian Callen Show with my partner in crime, Hunter Motz. And uh, <clears throat> very excited to have Matt Ridley, uh, who wrote The Rational Optimist. And I, I got to tell you, my father, again, has probably mentioned this book. My father, who's one of my heroes and is one of the smartest guys I know and a successful man in his own right and has read probably everything. And uh, he's mentioned this book, I would say, and I'm not exaggerating, a hundred times. But I mentioned it every day in conversation <laughs> as sort of ammunition for the naysayers and the pessimists of the world who say things like, well, the world's getting is worse off than it was. Um, and so when I told him that I had Matt Ridley, I, that I was interviewing you for my podcast, my father kind of went, well, you, he stopped. He just went, you are? I said, yeah, I said, well, that guy, that guy's, are, that's a heavyweight. That's, so suddenly, all of a sudden, after all the things I've done in my life, I'm now legitimate in his eyes because I'm interviewing Matt Ridley. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Ridley, for granting me the opportunity to, to, you know, laud praise on you because I have to start this whole conversation with saying, I think I agree with a hundred percent of your book, <laughs> because the well, world. Your father, the, is now, your father is now one of my heroes too. Right? <laughs> so, you see how these, <laughs> that's exactly how it works. Uh, let's talk a little bit. I want I want to familiarize people with with the, the premise of your book, and and that is that you know as far as and, and we'll talk about by which metric you you measure this by which measuring stick, but for the most part or for all parts, the world is far a far better place to live than it was or ever uh, than it was even 30 or 40 years ago and and certainly than it ever has been. And that's the the basic premise of your book and you do such a great job of supporting that thesis. And so let, let's start there and and sort of what got you to write the book in the first place and and you know i mean it's 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 a, a real bold undertaking but a great um obviously it's gotten a lot of praise and things uh and also yeah. generated a lot of controversy yeah indeed and, and a lot of people don't like it cuz cuz uh, i'm raining on their their pessimist parade a bit um uh you know there's a lot of money in pessimism 
optimism. It, it turns out. I mean, I think what what got me started was was the realization uh, that uh, an awful lot of the uh, trends in the world were actually going in the right direction, and nobody wanted to talk about that. Um, you know, when I was a student, I was told nothing but bad news about the future. I was told that uh, the population explosion was unstoppable, the oil was running out, the desert was advancing, uh, the uh, cancer was going to kill us because of all the pesticides we were using, uh, you know, a famine was inevitable, uh, all these kind of things. And I believed them, actually. I mean, I, I thought the grown-ups knew what they were talking about. Um, and, um, and so I actually started out as an adult pretty worried about the future of the world. And I was just determined that my kids, who are teenagers uh, a couple of years ago, um, well, they're both they're still teenagers, um, should not have that experience. So I was kind of writing it for them to, to uh, I'm, I'm not sure they've read it, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny, uh, I know. But, um, uh, no, my son has, I'm not sure my daughter has, but it's not her kind of book, but um, uh, it's, um, you know, it's it's for people like that is to say, look, hang on a minute. Every time someone tells you that we're doomed, um, uh, you should know that they've said that before and they were wrong before. And actually, the extraordinary thing is that in my lifetime, in the in the in the 55 now years that I've been on this planet, uh, the population of the Earth has doubled. Um, mm. And so we ought to be in real trouble. And instead of that, the average life expectancy of the average human being has gone up by 30% in that time. Uh, all over the world, that's wow. extraordinary achievement. Yeah. The average income has trebled, and the chances that you will bury a child, which is the biggest measure of misery that anybody can think of, I, I agree. think. I have children, I can tell you, that's for sure, yeah. Is down by two-thirds. Child mortality is down by two-thirds. It's one-third as great as it was in the 1950s. Now, that's still too high and all that kind of thing, and you can move on to talk about other things. And, and people say, well, isn't that at the expense of the environment? So I then run through some, you know, the amount of oil spilled in the ocean is down by 90%. The amount of pollution coming out of a car is less when it's uh, traveling at 70 miles an hour today than when it was stationary in 1970. You know, these are the wow. sorts of amazing um, achievements in 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 terms of the environment in terms of uh, human living standards Stephen Pinker has done this wonderful job since my book came out in cataloging the decline of violence but I mentioned some of it too you know the the 2000s was the decade with the lowest number of deaths in warfare in recorded history uh, globally it's not true for Britain or America because of Iraq and Afghanistan but it was true globally um, so Amazing. these Ordinary trends that are all heading in the right direction and very I thought there was good I, when I set out to write the book I thought there was going to be a bunch of statistics that I would have to admit were going in the wrong direction and apart from obesity and one or two other things I had to concede very little actually I, I amazed my happiness I thought happiness was something that was clearly going in the wrong direction because economists had measured it and said we were all getting miserable um, and I thought well that was just because we were telling each other to be miserable. Uh, but <laughs> we're actually getting happier. Uh, yeah. But within countries and between countries and within people's <clears throat> lifetimes, the trend is on the whole for greater wealth to, to correlate with greater happiness. It's not, um, uh, it's not you know, linear and it's not, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's not definite that you will get happier as you get richer. In fact, you know, very, very rich people seem to make themselves pretty unhappy sometimes but that's okay because it cheers up everybody else <laughs> <laughs> good old shot and, and, and give us give us um you, what your what met by what metric you you measure these kinds of things i love i love it i love how you how you describe the amount of working hours it takes to put uh food on the table the the amount of stored labor it t you you use these great economic sort of terms that we don't think about for the most part so use give us give us your measuring stick well, I'm not trained as an economist. I'm sort of self-taught in, in economics to some extent. And so I, I bring a kind of naivety to the, to the question. And I, I just was curious about this question. What is prosperity? What does it mean to, to, to be better off? You know, uh, why does it happen to us and not to rabbits or rocks? Um, and uh, the answer I came up with was that in the end, it all boils down to time. The amount of time, because, you know, money doesn't mean it. Money is just sort of lumps of gold or paper that you can lose or uh, you know what what does that mean what what money gets you or what prosperity means is a reduction in the amount of time it takes to fulfill your needs uh, 
So, uh, and, and when you think about it, we've moved steadily away from self-sufficiency and towards getting other people to do things for us. We've become more and more specialized as producers. You know, you produce a radio show, I produce books. You know, we, we, we have this single thing called a job. Mm. Um, uh, and yet we've become more and more diversified as consumers because if, if you were having to consume only the things you produced, you'd obviously have to, you know, be a farmer rather than a radio uh, show. Well, I, lo I love the, exp the, the example you use with the toaster uh, and how one man could never make a toaster. And if you did, my God, it would take you forever and it would it be would an be inferior terrible. product and <laughs> yeah. be a fortune where you could buy a toaster for four pounds. In fact, uh, and this was, uh, and I think you wrote the book in 2008, uh, you know, it, 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 it's that, uh, I think William F. Buckley in one of his books uh, talked about how, how hard it would be to make a pencil. And it was the same notion of just, it, this yeah. is the division of labor, this is, this is the value of people sort of, you know, not only ideas having sex, which uh, you put it so bluntly, I love, and then, uh, but the idea that we are all working sort of in concert with each other. Yeah, we're working for each other. That's yeah. the great story of civilization. We 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 work more for each other than we did in the past, and we and we work less for ourselves in a sense. Mm. Uh, and and so actually, when people say you know the market is this thing that makes us all selfish, it's not true. We become more and more dependent on each other, and more and more dependent on on being able to trust each other, and so on. Uh, and um, uh, it's I mean the, uh, the 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 consequence is that as I say you cut the amount of time it takes to fulfill a need because someone else does half the things for you and I have this this sort of nice example of a, of a computer mouse in in a sense I'm just riffing off that story of the pencil that was told originally by Leonard Reed in 1958 in a wonderful little essay called I Pencil which oh that is, might be what it is yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, Buckley talked about it, and Friedman talked about it, and other people talked about it. But it it goes back to this this essay in which the pencil tries to work out how it came into being, and it realizes that not just hundreds, but thousands or millions of people were involved in making this pencil because somebody had to grow the coffee in Brazil that was drunk by the man who was. Uh, cutting down a tree in Oregon whose timber was going to be used in the factory to be combined with the graphite from Sri Lanka, you know, da da da, yeah. to make a pencil. Uh, but the point is, not one of these people knew how to make a pencil. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The guy who ran the pencil company didn't know how to make a pencil. He just knew how to run a company. The, the knowledge was shared between people in this extraordinary distributed way. And this is one of the great insights, I think, of economics. And it's one that, that I had to sort of rediscover while writing this book because it hadn't really dawned on me before, um, that actually everything we possess, everything we do requires – Distributed collective intelligence describe, dis, requires cooperation between minds, and the knowledge is out there in the sort of um, in between our minds rather than within individual minds, um, uh, and it's the process of sharing ideas that produces this increase in prosperity for individual human beings, and given that there's no limit on the number of ideas we can have. And given that the more you connect people up, the more their ideas are going to meet and mate and produce new ideas, then the chances are that this process of improving our living standards is going to accelerate and not, not, not reach some limit. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, it's funny. You're in London. We're Skyping now, and it's like you're right in front of me. And, and in fact, I've read that a lot of scientists all over the world Skype with each other in different countries and share ideas. Uh, so, so it seems that technology and science and things are growing at an exponential rate, and it seems, and, and in fact, that's kind of what happens. I mean, the idea. I think it was Juan Enriquez, who's a venture capitalist, uh, uh, a venture capital sort of a. Um, a I know what. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah well, and he and he said, ideas can happen. I, there was some. There was some saying where you you know it takes a hundred years to come up with an idea, and then. And then progress happens in weeks. I mean, leaps and bounds happen in weeks because it's sort of – there's a boiling point, a tipping point where everything cascades and, and here's the final product. Uh, I think we're living in a time when – I mean, I guess I'm, I, what I'm asking is if you were to write the book in 2013, um, five years later, right now, how would your book be different? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I was writing right in the middle of the uh, great financial crisis. 
Which, and, by the way, we have to talk about that. That's that's just to stop you. That's what was so remarkable to me. I mean, you know, the, the one thing I was going to ask before I read the book was, yeah. well, what about the financial, you know, collapse? Yeah. And, and you address that. And we'll talk about that in a second. But go on. So, so you, you were saying and I, you know, to some extent, you can see that I was hedging my bets. I was saying, I think growth will return, but it's just possible that we're on the brink of some terrible economic abyss. If we are, it's not because of technology and things like that. It's because of politics. That's mm-hmm. that's clearly going to, you know, if 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 we shut down world trade, this is in two thousand and eight. Um, uh, then uh, yeah, all bets are off. Um, well, uh, you know, so I'm amazed by how growth has returned to the world. Uh, I mean, if you look at global economic growth, it shot back up. In in I mean, there was only one year actually, when uh, the world had negative growth. And that negative growth was 0.6%. Uh, wow. In the wow. Year in- you just never hear about this in the mainstream media. You know, you well, just don't. Just, yeah, but but the growth the next year was 5%. So we had 10 times as much growth in one year as we'd had shrinkage in the year before. Now, that's the world as a whole. Uh, and it's not true, obviously. I mean, my country is still to get back to where it was. Uh, your country has just about got back to where it was before the financial crisis. But uh, the eurozone is still way behind. Mm. You know, so there are parts of the world that have done really badly in the last five years. Um, but what's? The, but that, of course, implies that there are other parts of the world that are roaring ahead. And I genuinely thought that Africa, which had had a great few years before the financial crisis, would probably be plunged back into kind of warfare and, you know, disputes and and uh, all these problems in fact africa has come roaring back and is having five six percent in some countries eight nine percent growth so extraordinary yeah, your your, your, your okay. example of botswana blew my mind i yeah. thought when you described the country you were talking about the congo you know eight different tribes and all these things and all kinds of disease yes. i thought oh boy this is going to be a set and then and botswana which <laughs> with ha- faster growth than like peru and bolivia and i was just like wow and, and that was really an eye opener. Yeah, it's a, it's a very <clears throat> country and all that kind of thing. But you know, Botswana has this extraordinary track record of of sustained economic growth. So it can be done, even in a landlocked African country like like Botswana. Uh, and you know, the other statistic I came up with early in the book was that there are just five or maybe six countries that have seen living standards decline since 1950 um there afghanistan congo sierra leone you know you can name terrible wars civil somalia wars. probably but the rest you know it's very difficult to, to live in a country that's actually got worse and most of us live in countries that have seen extraordinary improvements so so i think one of the things i'd, I'd do differently if i was writing the book now is i'd be even more confident about predicting economic growth particularly for poor countries for africa for and of course what this means is that um uh, inequality is going down. Uh, I mean, there's this extraordinary uh, catch-up by poor countries. Poor countries are growing fast, faster than rich countries. People in, you know, poor people in in poor countries are getting fast, fast getting rich. Sorry, my my. Uh, your English, your English isn't good. Yes, it's not his first language. Everybody, he's from Britain. They don't. They just learn English. Yeah, yeah. it's not native language. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's Hunter. Was well, gonna what ask I was going to say is it's interesting that you mentioned the example of Botswana because uh, Darren Asimoglu and James Robinson, who wrote this book, Why Nations Fail, really talk about why is Botswana such a success um, in sub-Saharan Africa. And the reason why is because they have the political and the economic institutions that encourage ideas having sex, that encourage innovation. And I think that's the point is, is that. You know, much of what you're saying in this book is is that if people are allowed to interact with each other and allowed to trade and allowed to compete and allowed to do all of these things, prosperity follows. And the problem is, is when the government interferes with that process or when, you know, that very sort of natural basic desire to trade of people is interfered with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that for me, that's that's the great lesson is that that you you allow prosperity to happen. You don't cause prosperity to happen. Mm -hmm. That it, that it emerges from the interactions of, of people. And in particular, I mean, I, I, I then decided to go back in time to try and work out, you know, when this process started and when human beings, as it were, left behind being just an ordinary species and had this thing called progress happening to them and what caused that. And for me, it's all about exchange and trade. Um, in other words, 
uh, it's not really about language. Language seems to come too early in the story, and it's not about tool using because we've been doing that for two and a half million years. Neanderthals had language, Neanderthals had tool using, but they don't seem to have experienced anything that we would call progress, either in their technology or in their population or, or in their, their living standards. Um, what comes along suddenly in, in Africa a couple of hundred thousand years ago is people who, who swap things, who say, look, I've got too, my, too many uh, 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 axes, you've got too many spears, why don't I give you some of mine, you give me some of yours, <laughs> and we're both better off for the deal. Hmm. Uh, and once you start that process, you get good at making axes, and he gets good at making spears. So actually it get, takes you less time. To, to, to get your spear from him because you, you only have to make one extra axe and so on. And so, so you get this extraordinary fast breeder reactor, this, this, um, this vi virtuous circle whereby you, you build this prosperity. So, so I think the, the habit of exchanging one thing from another is right at the heart of, of, of human living standard changes uh, and has been for hundreds of thousands of years. And it's what, it's what explains why institutions work for the betterment of human beings when they do is because they encourage people to exchange goods and services. They encourage people to do things for each other. You know, uh, th this book should be sold right along guns, germs, and steel. It, it should be the, the sequel to gun in some ways. I really was uh, kind of thought, what a, what a great compliment to that book. And, and you say, let's talk about goods and services, because you're a huge <clears throat> proponent of the marketplace when it comes to goods and services. It just works. Free markets work when you're dealing with goods and services. They don't work when you're dealing with capital. You're pretty, and you were a banker, I think, and you're pretty critical of that. And talk about that a little bit, because you know, yeah. in in, in um, my country, and I'm, I'm sure in Britain as well, you hear a lot of people say, "Well, capitalism has failed to an extent, and we need to come up with a different idea, maybe more socialism, more central planning. It's becoming too crazy and chaotic." Well, nothing, of course, I couldn't disagree more. I think what's making America work, in fact, is commerce on, 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 you know, in the Internet. It's still the, at least people are – the government hasn't figured out a way to get their hands in, involved in that. I, I'm, I've always believed in, in free markets. But they do have a point when it comes to, it seems, <clears throat> capital markets. They tend to bubble and they tend to burst and people lose all their, their savings. Talk a little bit about your pessimism in regards to – capitalism when it when it relates to actual capital money money markets etc yeah well um i've even been using the phrase recently for my views which is that i'm a free market anti-capitalist which, which <laughs> I'm gonna, and by the way guess who's stealing that right here go ahead yeah yeah and so I will brian's think, dad I think in some ways what what we now call capitalism and what most people assume you mean when you say capitalism isn't necessarily a very free market thing uh it's a it's a it's a a a a, a, a bunch of big businesses that talk to each other and that that cartelize the market if they can and in particular they get government favors and they spend a lot of their time speculating on the the future value of assets whether it's shares or or um uh, other kinds of um uh you know uh, financial instruments um uh, which isn't really about goods and services and it isn't really about markets and it, the penny dropped for me when I was listening to the, the wonderful Nobel Prize winning economist Vernon Smith from um, um, Chapman University. Uh, and he was talking about uh, the difference between uh, markets in goods and services versus markets in assets. And he invented experimental economics, which is this thing where you put a bunch of undergraduates in, in a room and, and give them $10 to play with in a, in a particular kind of game and observe what happens. And basically, the conclusion of his first 10 years of experiments was that if you simulate a market in goods and services, hamburgers or haircuts, you know, things that you consume, uh, then people end up discovering pretty efficient outcomes. And it doesn't matter if the information is asymmetric or whatever. People end up getting the best deal for everybody uh, once it's the system has settled down, that markets are extraordinarily efficient things. But if you simulate in this experiment goods, uh, markets in assets, uh, markets in things that you can hoard and resell at a profit if you're clever, then you get a bubble and then you get a bust. 
And you get that every time. And you get it even when the same undergraduates have played the same game 10 minutes before and, and, and it's gone wrong and everybody's ended up ruined by the bus. So in other words, there's this inherent problem once you've got goods for, for resale um, that you get speculative bubbles followed by busts. We don't seem to be able to prevent, us, uh, prevent ourselves doing them. And when you're in the bubble, you don't think you're in the bubble. You justify the fact that you know prices should be this high. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is classically what happened in the housing market and and in uh, the financial markets generally in the run-up to 2008. And by the way, it's and happened, I, it's happened in, in, in our financial markets. I'm talking about the United States. It's happened over and over again for the past 150 years. Yeah, and even further yeah, back to the a, Dutch tulip crisis. And, you know, yeah, I mean, that's right. South Sea, sea bubble, bubble in yeah. Britain and the become <clears throat> France and all this kind of thing. And, and we haven't learned, and we're still not learning. Um, and, uh, and by the way, it wasn't deregulation caused this particularly uh, because it, it can happen in really quite regulated markets. And in fact, when you look at what caused the, um, uh, the, the, the bubble in the early 2000s in, in house prices, the government's fingers are all over this That's because right. of mm -hmm. this business of, of trying to encourage, uh, as it were, subprime lending through the... Uh, People various, who couldn't afford a house, let's say Equal Housing Lending yeah, Act and that kind of stuff. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, you know, that, <clears> that's <throat> very persuasive. So, so it's not a matter of, uh, you know, Free markets caused this, and if 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 we didn't have uh, if if we had a better regulation, I mean, of course we do need regulation in markets. Um, and but when people say to me, "Don't isn't it obvious that we need more regulation?" Well, I'm not convinced. I think we need better regulation, clearly, but more regulation isn't necessarily going to make things better. It might make mm -hmm. things worse. And I had a ringside seat at the financial crisis. As you say, I was not executive chairman of a, of a bank, which got into trouble. And, uh, you know, that was a terrible experience for me and for uh, customers and shareholders and, and everybody else. But people say, well, you know, why did you ignore the regulators? And I say, I didn't. The regulators just come and see us regularly and mm. sit down talk about it and they would say your business is in great shape you're a low risk institution and we would say what should we be worrying about and they sh said you should be worrying about credit risk and we would go away and say right well that's what we'll worry about in fact we should have been worried about liquidity risk credit risk is fine the business actually is still going fine in terms of its credit risk but the liquidity risk blew us up mm -hmm. so if a regulator is concentrating on the wrong thing it can actually do more harm than good what's the solution <laughs> <laughs> that's his next book <laughs> that's his next book the next challenge uh, yeah yeah so uh, it uh i mean because you're uh, almost it, talking about human you're talking about you know human impulses almost that there's an incentive structure i think built into the human brain sometimes mm -hmm. where you know yes i'm taking a risk but i've seen a lot of people get fabulously wealthy they i can count them on my hand but i'm gonna be and i won't be guys. the sucker who's holding the losing lottery ticket at yeah, the end i of mean the... i come to california i'll show you a lot okay. of actors a lot of actors who think they're gonna be movie stars you got a better chance of being a senator but, <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. but but listen there's a reason that so many acting classes are full i mean what you know one thing we need to try and do is try and get people to think of their houses as a good or a service rather than as a a, 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 a casino chip uh, mm -hmm. You know, so that's one thing. You know, whenever you see people, uh, you know, in, in London, it got crazy in the early 2000s. People would only talk about how much the value of that house had gone up. You know, that was yeah. a bad sign. So, so you need to, and and, and we need to have um, regulators who 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 puncture the bubble early on, not not right. after, not make it worse once it's bursting. Um, uh, and you know, in general, I think the the big takeaway from the Vernon Smith point which is one that people still don't discuss i mean i'm banging banging away at this point but nobody else is making this point to my knowledge um is that you need to regulate the hell out of financial markets but deregulate commercial markets uh mm -hmm. so in other words you know i don't need someone checking whether my toothpaste is is um adulterated uh, the retailer is going to make damn sure it isn't because it's his, his interest to sell me a good product and That's and right. so on you know so so we need to discriminate at the moment in the 2000s we did the opposite we were we were over regulating ordinary retail activities and ordinary commerce too much and we were under regulating financial markets so so the, it's well, just the, a little the bit. internet has taken care of a lot of that you can you can buy the internet's still not very regulated and there's a lot of commerce that goes on with ebay and things like that thank god you know it seems that that's yes, part of the that, america that works and that's going to that's going to get better. I mean, I'm very interested in the way in which we're undermining governments and we're moving, you know, we're moving uh, offshore in a funny way. Um, That's right. To, to 
these things and bitcoin is 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 not going to take over the world but it's it's a it's a harbinger of what might happen to currencies and to um uh, and and to the world if we could find ways on the internet of doing commerce through barter and through other things that where we don't even have to tell governments what we're up to so i do think that's that's going to happen i almost feel as though yeah governments at least federal governments are being sidelined to 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 a large extent i mean you know it's it's i don't even hear people talking about obama or the obama administration maybe because i don't live in washington but i really don't hear a lot I think there's a, I mean, the the reality is, is that, you know, obviously we're so aware of the president and, you know, I mean, he's such a symbolic figure, but this goes back to what you're talking about, human psychology, right? We feel like violence has increased because we can all like point to World War II or the Korean War or anything like that, but we don't see the real trend, right? Mm. And it's the same thing with Obama. I mean, the thing that I always find fascinating from an educational standpoint is everybody always talks about the president and education, what's his educational policy. The number of educational dollars that the president actually controls is tiny because most it's controlled at the state and local level. Hmm. Um, wow. So, I mean, you know, I think it's... It, yeah, it's, but not only that, but what's happening to education in terms of the Khan Academy and... Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, 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 massive online... That's, um, what's, that's what's so exciting. Is, yeah, you can get a... a, a these these yeah. are going to transform education. You can right. get a hell of an education now for $5,000 by, by uh, some, uh, online university. I mean, you take classes anywhere you want. And that's what's incredible. Well, guys, if you like fantasy football, it is back. And DraftKings.com is celebrating with millions. That's right. I said millions in cash prizes. DraftKings, uh, one-day games mean you never get locked into a season, okay? It's it's a one-day fantasy sports thing. It's like a new season every time you play. So pick your team in minutes, and you can instantly, and I mean instantly, be getting your share of the million dollars they're awarding kickoff week yeah i said it week one this football season a million bucks is up for grabs DraftKings is where anyone and i mean anyone can enter with a couple bucks and win big cash prizes true story one guy won a hundred grand his very first time a hundred grand day one so play for free yeah free at draftkings.com enter callen c-a-l-l-e-n with your first pay game and get free entry I love free. Into the million dollar kickoff bash. Seriously. Free entry. That could win you thousands just playing fantasy football. Use Callen, my name, C A L L E N, at DraftKings.com. Let me say it one more time DraftKings.com. But only if you like football. <laughs> and if you're an American, <laughs> which I am. Yeah, and the idea that education should remain stuck in this uh, medieval model where you all gather in one room and one man mm. stands up front and pontificates, you know, <laughs> that's got to go. Um, yeah. uh, uh, Hunter has written a book uh, about education called The Straight A Conspiracy and, and talks about how education now is taught. It's a tyrannical sort of uh, uh, model. If you will, uh, uh, right? I mean, yeah, top, I mean, top, top, rather than a bottom up one, I guess. Yeah. Exactly, and that's the whole point. Is is that ultimately, you know, I mean, what what we're seeing now is is that there's Basically, I mean, the first thing that you have to do is, is that, you know, we've been convinced that the man in the room has all of the answers, which is why we keep on showing up to the room. But there's a growing re realization as people are going out and teaching themselves through the Khan Academy that you don't need the man in the room. Right. All you really need is the, uh, an access to an Internet connection. And then you can find whichever teacher works best for you, which really just puts the student in charge instead of the teacher. Mm. Yes, and and the, the and, and and the teacher himself eventually gets replaced by the internet in some right. way. I mean, the, the the one of the most inspiring people I've met since my book came out. I met him at the at TED Global. And he's recently won the TED Prize. Is Sagata Mitra, who is the guy who uh, is behind the movie Slumdog Millionaire, because he did this extraordinary experiment where he put a, a laptop in a in a slum in Delhi and worked out what people did with it if they could get access to the internet. And he then came up with this extraordinary um, thing called uh, self-organized learning, which is you go into a, a school in a poor part of India where they don't even speak English and you give them um, computers with access to the internet, one, per, one for every four children. It mustn't be one-to-one. -one. That spoils it. Uh, and you, you say, um, uh, here's a question. Here's a well-posed question. Uh, I'm going to come back in three weeks and I want to know the answer. And his question was, what is biotechnology? 
the first time he did this. And the teacher said, you can't ask questions like that. They don't know anything. <laughs> they don't, they don't speak English. They've never used the Internet. He said, I don't care. I'm, I'm not going to give them any hints. I'm just going to walk away. And I'm going to come back in three weeks. And when he came back in three weeks, they said, we don't understand. We don't know what biotechnology is. And he says, oh, well, um, sorry about that. And they said, because, you see, we... When we use restriction enzymes, we don't understand how you, you know, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome because when we use restriction enzymes, <laughs> yeah, I can't get that far ahead. I, I, I still don't have my, the chemical. Uh, you know, That's these, hilarious. These, these 12-year-old Indians with no English had taught themselves, you know, middle-level chemistry technology. incredible incredible <laughs> man he's, he's well, done this all over the world now he's got some wonderful stories about it and and uh, uh and and he you know you do, it's not the whole answer you still need good teachers mm-hmm. but it's amazing what you can do through self-organized well learning. and and the other thing too is is that you know the, the the majority of the work is being taken on by the student like the student goes in makes all the progress they can on their own which really frees up the teacher's time to then be able to provide those little tweaks and those little adjustments. Um, yeah. Well, you, you talk, uh, you take on um, two things, and I want to talk about climate change and organic farming. Uh, it's five years later. How do you feel about climate change? Because you, you basically, you know, you, you, there's, a, there's a large political element in climate change. Maybe you could explain that, because it, climate change and the warming of the planet is considered gospel, uh, on the two coasts I spend my time, which is New York and California, uh, and certainly a lot of the, uh, I think a lot of the country and a lot of the world believes that global warming is a very real threat. Very, well, I don't know where I'm at. I'm on the fence with it. I don't know enough. Uh, don't spend enough time with it. But what, what does your research tell you five years later? Are you worried that we're that the oceans are going to rise? Are you worried we're going to all die? What, what, what's the, uh, what's the prognosis, sir? Yeah, it's a good. It's a. It's a, it's a. Key question, and it's one that I agonized about whether to even include in the book. Several people advised me, look, don't put it in because, uh, you know, it'll it'll distract from the other messages you've, you've got and so on. And I said, well, I've got to put it in because I'm, I'm criticizing every other doomsaying scenario that that's the, the, the people have done. And they've all been wrong so far. And my gut tells me that this one is exaggerated, too, just like all the others have been exaggerated. And not just my gut, but my head tells me that. I've actually been writing about climate change on and off since 1988, I realize, is when I first wrote a published an article on, on, on climate change. Uh, and at the time, I was a standard alarmist. I read, this, read the physics and I saw that, you know, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Uh, and I still think that. I still think it is a greenhouse gas. And I think that we are increasing its concentration. And we're likely to cause warming. But what's become clear is that the, the science had got very, very politicized. And I couldn't believe, you know, what happened actually just before my book came out, but after I'd written it with the, the climate gate uh, emails, which showed that, you know, there'd been a lot of manipulation and, and politicization behind the scenes. Since then, um, we've seen uh, a steady downgrading of the rate at which climate change is likely to happen by the official bodies. They haven't, in my view, come down far enough, but they're getting closer and closer to what I would call my lukewarm position, which is, yes, it's real and yes, it's happening, but no, it's not necessarily going to be dangerous for a very long time. Um, uh, And this is completely consistent with the physics, by the way, because it turns out you can't really get dangerous climate change from carbon dioxide alone. You've got to have positive feedbacks from water vapor in the atmosphere to get that. Uh, And on top of that, uh, even if it is happening, uh, it's not clear that asking this generation of relatively poor people to spend a fortune on really bad technologies that don't actually reduce carbon dioxide emissions very much, like wind turbines, uh, is going to help the next, uh, their grandchildren, who are going to be a hell of a lot richer, uh, and who are going to have much better technologies. So uh, I, uh, in all sorts of ways, I think we are overreacting to this issue, whereas we should uh, you know, study it uh, and look at the technologies we've got available and put a lot of money into research to try and improve low-carbon energy and so on, but not put a lot of money into decarbonization. And isn't, because the, I th- isn't the technology already there? I mean, the air in California, has got, at least Los Angeles, has gotten way better I mean, cars are burning so much cleaner. And you use an example. What was it that you said? What the car in the seventies just idle burns way more carbon, puts more, way more carbon in the air than than a, the car on the highway it's, now. It's not really about carbon, though. That's about that was about 
pollution. That okay, was the bad yeah. stuff that causes smog. Yeah, so volatile yeah. organic compounds, they're right. called, which was, you know, Pasadena used to be unbreathable in the 1950s. It's not now, even though it's got three times as many cars. Why is that? Because basically cars don't leak as much volatile organic compounds, either when they're running or even when they're stationary. Right. Uh, and a car parked in a driver with the engine off used to produce more of these things uh, in 1970 than a car driving at 70 miles an hour on a freeway does <laughs> with today. The engine <laughs> off, with the engine off. With the engine off. How yeah. is that? That's amazing. Well, because this stuff leaked out of the out of the petrol tank, amazing. and it got into the air and it, and it uh, the gas tank. Sorry, and it got into the air and it mixed with uh, uh, oxygen, and it caused these smogs. Right. Um, so, uh, but but that's not to say. I mean, obviously, a car park produces a lot less carbon dioxide than a, than a car traveling. You know, but sure, engines are getting more efficient, and we've increased the and we have decarbonized the economy, and that's the other interesting thing that's happening is that if you look at the the global. Uh, carbon to hydrogen ratio in our fuel mix because we basically get all our energy from either oxidizing hydrogen or oxidizing carbon uh, and that's why they're called carbohydrate uh, sorry hydrocarbons because mm. they've got um, uh, car carbon and hydrogen in them and by switching from wood to coal to oil to gas we've steadily reduced the amount of carbon we burn and increased the amount of hydrogen we burn uh, and it's a wonderfully steady progression, actually. It's a very straight line. It was discovered by somebody called Jesse Orzabel at Rockefeller University. And if you plot that line out, we're going to hit pretty well zero or 90% hydrogen in 2070. Now, we can't get there with methane. We've got to go beyond natural gas to something other, which probably means we'll be using um, fusion or other kinds of nuclear technology to get hydrogen out of out of water. But at the moment, you know, we're seeing extraordinary progressions just by switching to natural gas. And America has had the fastest fall in carbon dioxide emissions of any uh, country uh, entirely because of the shale gas revolution, which means that hmm. you've cut, closed down a lot of coal plants and opened a lot of gas plants. Doesn't, doesn't gas shale gas cause a great deal of pollution itself? No, um, it doesn't. I mean, it, it really doesn't. I mean, there's there's talk of fugitive methane coming out when you when you drill for it, but actually those numbers turned out to be specious. And in fact, uh, you know, there, there was there was. Um, there was a calculation which said that seven percent of the methane was going to escape into the atmosphere. Um, it turned out this was based on the the loss in ga in Russian gas pipelines. Well, actually, um, seven percent gets lost in Russian gas pipelines, not pipelines, not through leakage, but through theft. So that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, but there's also there's also the idea that it takes a great deal of water. And you talk a little bit about, um, you know, water tables falling. And, and one of the issues that we have is just and, and yet we're using a lot of drip technology, drip irrigation technology that the Middle East has been using for a yeah. long time. But 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 that's that's a good example. I mean, in, in shale gas uses one uh, percent of the water used in Texas is used for oil and gas drilling. Um, Ninety nine percent is used for other things. About 80 percent is used for irrigation. If you want to get worried about water, get worried about agriculture, not about uh, oil and gas drilling. They're irrelevant. The, the quantities may seem big when you sort of measure it in millions of gallons, but in terms of the total use, agriculture is a far, far bigger user of water. Now, in terms of irrigation, if you don't price water right, then people waste it. People use it wastefully and, and spraying it on crops with big, you know, what do they call those things that go around in circles that you see when you're flying over the western states. Um, uh, Central pivot irrigation, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, uh, that wastes a lot of water. Mm -hmm. If you go from that to, uh, you know, sort of hydroponic irrigation that just literally drips the water straight onto the roots of the plant, you can cut water use by something like 99%. And people like the Israelis and the Cypriots are doing this wow. very effectively. And by so, the way, by the way, isn't it also true that organic farming when compared to the technology we have available to create nutritious food, organic farming actually produces more pollution uh, in many ways. Well, organic farming has all sorts of disadvantages. I mean, uh, if you remember, the bean sprouts in Germany, which were organic last year, killed 53 people. Well, no genetically modified crop has ever killed anybody, let alone 53 people in one, in one month. Um, so, uh, From bacteria, was, it was uh, E. coli? They were using dung and therefore E. coli and da da da. You know, so you know it's not it's not doesn't mean you should never eat it, but it does mean that it's a risk. Um, so, but the real problem with organic farming that I have is that it requires too much land. 
I mean, the really the big difference is that it doesn't use synthetic fertilizer. Uh, what the rest of farming does is it gets nitrogen out of the air, which is 80% nitrogen, and turns that into fertilizer and uses that on 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 the crops. Uh, and that's done through a chemical process. Uh, and if you if you're not going to use the nitrogen out of the air fixed in that way, then you have to rely on natural nitrates in the soil, which is replenished to some extent by thunderstorms, and it's replenished by uh, nitrogen-fixing plants, uh, and it's, and you can replenish it by grazing a, a cow uh, next door and getting its dung and using that as manure, um, uh, all these ways. But nonetheless, you're always going to have a lower yield. Uh, and something like half the nitrogen atoms in your body was fixed through a, a chemical plant. Um, I love uh, that. I, I love that in the book. That was so great. I was like, that's so weird. What we? But it's a great, it's a great thing so to say. Yeah. If, if we were organic, if, we, if the world was organic, we would need more than twice as much land to produce the same amount of food as we do produce. Well, bango the rainforest, bango the swamps, <laughs> bango the deserts. You know, actually, uh, it's a very good thing that we've been able to use fertilizer to get yields up in conventional agriculture so that we can spare nat nat uh, national parks and forests and all these kind of things. Well, not only that, you talk, uh, you'd also touch on genetic engineering, BT cotton and things like that, where... You know, it, it, the boll weevil uh, worm um, was very devastating to cotton crops. We had to spray the shite out of him. And now we, we, we implanted a, a tiny little um, a toxin into the genetic structure of the corn, I mean of the cotton, and boll weevil worms die and other animals, birds and butterflies and these things don't die yep. when they land on it. Um, that strikes me as not even inorganic that just makes common sense if you have a technology that allows us to spray less water and spray less herbicide and pesticide uh because you have altered the genetics of this particular plant which we've been doing by the way we've been doing since the beginning of agriculture i mean we've been Absolutely. cross pollinating genes since the beginning and now we're just doing it with gamma rays and things like that um you know that that that, well, that seems to be the irony. The gamma ray technology is is the one that preceded genetic modification. Before we knew how to sort of take one gene out of one organism, put it into another, we used to just kind of go in and uh, you know like a bull in a china shop and smash up some genes and see what happened. Mm. And we did that with gamma rays, and that's called um, uh, um, induced mutation. Uh, and organic farmers are quite happy to use the, the plants that come out of that. But they're not happy to use the ones where you've specifically taken a specific gene out of one organism and put it into another organically. Um, so that, as you say, you can make cotton resistant to, um, uh, to insects and thereby you don't need to spray it. And in India and Burkina Faso and all these other places, they're using this BT cotton now. And it's had a dramatic impact not only on the uh, economics for small farmers because they couldn't afford the sprays before. So now they can compete with big farmers. But also uh, they, uh, um, uh, they're, they're seeing wildlife come back into their fields to, to a much greater extent because there's more insects and more birds to eat the insects and so on. And so... Uh, it really is. An ex it, I just don't understand why the environmental movement um, went so far out on a limb against genetic modification uh, and got themselves into this extraordinary position of, of opposing a, a, an environmental technology. Well, I think it really comes back to what Brian was saying earlier. I mean, so much of what your book is about is about the difference between the facts and what makes sense in terms of human psychology. Right. I mean, you know, the, the reality is, is that it's easier for us to be pessimists than to be optimists, even though the facts say that we should be optimistic. And in the same way, even though genetic engineering actually makes a tremendous amount of se sense when you look at the realities of what are going on, for whatever reason, it makes people feel uncomfortable. Yes. And, and one of the, the commonest question I get asked uh, uh, if I give talks about about this book is, um, okay, you've persuaded me that uh, we should be optimistic. Why then are we so pessimistic? Uh, why do we always look on the dark side of everything? The Judeo-Christian uh, ethic? <laughs> the apocalypse? <laughs> We're an apocalyptic people? Maybe. Yeah, that's part of it. But, but um, it, curiously, we're not we're not too pessimistic about ourselves as individuals. In fact, we're slightly too optimistic. We think we're going to stay married longer than we do, for example. <laughs> you know, we're all, we think we're better drivers than we are. There's all sorts of ways in which we, we don't apply this to us as individuals, but we do apply it to the group and, and the race and the future. Um, and, and in part, it's because the, the past was certain and it turned out okay. You got here, you didn't, 
you know, you, you, you haven't died yet. Um, uh, whereas the future is uncertain. So you've got to be uh, worried about it. And this must go back to something in deep in our evolutionary psychology that the cautious guy survived um, because on the way to the waterhole, he said, hang on, I'm not going through those bushes. There might be a lion in them. And I said, no, 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 it's going to be fine. There are no lions. Everything turns out fine in the end. So I got eaten. And his genes are in the next generation, and mine aren't. Mm. Uh, his genes got there via my girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, love it. Uh, one of the things that I also really, really enjoyed about your book, you were at Cold Spring Harbor for a while, weren't you? Yes, I never actually spent uh, sort of, I mean, I, I used to sort of dip in and out, but I, but I spent, and I spent one summer there finishing a book. It's a wonderful place. Yeah, I was actually there. I worked there for a year and uh, lived in Dr. Watson's basement. Um, oh, you did that? I yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, I knew there, there's a distinguished group of people who've done that. Yeah, and we actually, you and I went to the same high school as well. Um, so, uh, but the, uh, the thing that I was going to say is, you know, I mean, you I went to eat. Yeah, I went to Eaton, uh, despite the American accent. I was going to say, you're, yeah. you're like, get, what's wrong with your accent, Hunter? Yeah. What, uh, what date were you there? Uh, I was there until 99, uh, 94 oh to 99. You're ludicrously young, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Hunter's a smart guy. But I'd actually, I mean, that's the thing. And then Come, he went to Harvard. Um, but coming from a biochemical background, I'd actually read some of your books before. I'd read Genome and, and you know, uh, The Red Queen. Um but so, you know, one of the things that I think is very interesting is, A, having read some of your earlier work, you see that, 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 that trend towards optimism coming out and out and again, like that that's something you want to say. You know, in genome, you talk about being optimistic about what we will do with this knowledge of the genome. Um, yes. And having grown up in England as well, one of the things that really resonated for me in The Rational Optimist is when you talk about, you know, what is the culture of the UK and, you know, what messages were particularly being sent in the UK and the idea that, you know, I mean, I think fundamentally that human beings are good, that they are capable of innovating, that they are capable of creating problems and then solving them as well. And, yep. uh, you know, I mean, I think that's what's so powerful and so imp important and life affirming about your book is the fact that, you know, we do back ourselves into corners and then amazingly we always seem to find a way out because human beings are able to create and innovate when we collaborate. Yes, and a couple of thoughts there. I mean, the first is that you're, you're right. When when uh, genomics was, was sort of in the news in, in the, uh, to around the turn of the century and I was writing about it, I was very struck by how much more pessimistic Europeans and Brits were than Americans at that stage. Um, because if you said, uh, if, if you gave a talk about the possibilities of genomics, uh, 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 an American would say, does this mean one day I'll be able to sequence my genes and find out, you know, how I can make myself healthier? Uh, and a Brit would say, does this mean one day someone's going to sequence my genes and discriminate against me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, talk about glass half full, glass half empty. Yeah. And, um, uh, 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 and, and, of course, but in some sense that, that distinction disappeared over the last 10 years. I don't think you Americans are, are, are as pe optimistic as you used to be. Maybe that's... It might not, be the not... financial crisis. It might be the two wars uh, we fought. I, I don't know what it is. I think it comes and goes, but I think Americans, the American character is almost always way more optimistic than most people. It might be that pioneering mentality. Um, what, that's true. The one thing I've and noticed... Also, you're, you're descended from people who had some get-up-and-go and some... Yeah. Um, to, and whereas we're descended from the people who stayed behind. That's right. I mean, it's a very aggressive culture, the U.S., I have to say. It's, it's, it's so fast-moving. And, and I always... On the other hand, yeah. 150 years ago, Victorian England, you know, it was can-do. Anything can happen. We can mm -hmm. change the world. We, you know, mm -hmm. we can solve any problem, etc. So what happened to our culture that it became so... I think um, like anything else, you know, people's cultures get fat and lazy and, and, and relaxed and rest on their laurels. That's, the that's Italians the... have been doing it for 2,000 years. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's, what's, uh, that's, that's always the, that's the rub for, for success, that's, you know. I've just done two interviews with, in Italy because my book is with, with Italian... Uh, journalists because my book's just coming out in italy and boy they were pessimistic oh i bet yeah. oh i bet you must be fighting an uphill battle but europe needs your book i mean well, that's what's you know and that's what's so interesting i mean do you know um you know you mentioned uh do you know have you ever heard of martin seligman martin seligman Su sullivan seligman seligman 
Seligman. Oh yes, I have. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, he he. I mean, you know, he writes about you know his, his basic struggle was you know for the last hundred years psychology has been focused on taking people from being utterly miserable and dysfunctional to like vaguely normal. Wouldn't it be nice if we could aim to actually make people happy? Um, ah. and, and so he started the positive psychology movement. But in one of his books, he has this amazing story, and it's about a friend of his who had a pet iguana. And the pet iguana would, was, like, sluggish. It wouldn't eat. He was really worried. He thought the iguana was going to die, all of this sort of stuff. And so he tries feeding the iguana everything. He feeds it, you know, dead flies. He feeds it Chinese food. He feeds it anything he can, and the iguana just won't eat. So he has the iguana out on his desk. He's not worried about it running away because it won't move. And he's reading his newspaper, and he throws his newspaper down. And the newspaper lands on the ham sandwich that he has sitting on his desk. And suddenly the iguana leaps into action and, like, tears apart the newspaper and devours the ham sandwich, right? And the reason why is because suddenly the iguana needed to struggle for its food. Yeah. And I think that's the thing is I think that, mm. you know, it is the process and the business of struggling and striving, right, that makes us optimistic, you know, you have to be like constantly fighting for things in order to feel like that. Because if you're not, if you are sitting around in the couch and have just sort of settled into, you know, some sort of torpor, some sort of sluggishness, that's when you descend into a pessimism. Yeah, well, the Tennessee Williams wrote a great essay called The Catastrophe of Success. And he says the wolf at the door is not struggle it's luxury and mm -hmm. it's a, it's a great it's a great essay what what do you think the the genome the genome project and yep. uh, I, I mean is there any reason for me to get my genome ta what would i learn if i if i had my genome done would i learn what my origins well, were would i learn you know what would i um well uh it, it, it i mean i have to say i am surprised by how little use it is to get to get one sequence done i mean i've done the 23 and me thing i've got all my you know hundreds of different um uh genes have been looked at uh, uh you know it's just this 200 hundred dollar thing you send off a toothbrush etc and it is fascinating um uh and uh but medically it's pretty useless i mean it tells me i've got a very slightly higher risk of this that and the other but you know we're talking two percent instead of one percent you've mm. got one percent up two percent risk well that's not going to change my life now of course it might find that i'm in one of the really high risk categories for parkinson's disease or alzheimer's or something like that and that would change my life so uh it can give you it could give you a big dollop of bad news but on the whole it does very little to change to change your world at the moment uh, which is surprising and what's interesting about the genome is that we thought it would all be about medicine you know when we were talking about understanding genes it was all about how it was going to be medical in fact the biggest use of genomics in terms of the ordinary person in the street uh, um, has been one forensics, you know, the ability to catch criminals, and two, um, uh, genealogy, finding right. out who you're related to, where your ancestors came from, uh, whether you're your father's child or not, um, uh, and that kind of thing. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so I don't think people predicted that. And some of the some of the ancestry stuff is really interesting. It's very hyped. And, you know, when you say your Y chromosome, my Y chromosome came from, um, you know, Irish ancestors, apparently. Uh, and so you suddenly start to think, oh, I've got a Celtic blood. You know, so I'm going to <laughs> blood. Yeah, 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 yeah. But actually, you know, your Y chromosome is 0.1% of your genome or something. So you oh, should that right? So, so, so in other words, they, they can't really tell what your Oops, origins sorry. are. They can't really tell what your origins are in, in that sense. You, you're not well, going to get mixed up. You know, I mean, uh, um, uh, you, you, you know, the, you, you get one chromosome from, uh, you, you know, you, by the time you go back 100 generations, you've got billions of ancestors. So there's no point in singling out any one. And so, well, there's, there's a famous story. Ronald Reagan, when he became president, you know, his, his whole ancestry was done, right? And, you know, they basically found out that he was related to all the heads of Europe except for King Zog of Albania. <laughs> and, you know, like this is a fact that he used to love to tell people. But the reality is if you go back 100 generations or whatever, we're all related everybody, to like, everybody. Everybody likes yeah. to have sex with everybody yeah. else, and that's the way it should be. <laughs> and, 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 and that includes... Includes ideas, and the book is The Rational Optimist, and uh, we very much appreciate uh, you joining us, man. This has been, uh, the, i, I got to tell you, it's been so much. What is the next book you're working on now? 
Oh, wait, Brian and Matt, so I'd just like to thank you for having me. It's been great. Um, I am working on another book. I'm going to be a little bit coy about what it's about because um, my publisher told me that I've got to stop talking about it. But it's kind of more, <laughs> more of Well, we're going to put the Irrational Optimist on the Brian Callen website, briancallen.com, because it's a must read. And I'm going to be recommending I've always recommended it anyway. But it's, it's such a pleasure to talk to you, a learning experience. And uh, there need to be more of you, my friend. So we appreciate you doing our, uh, our, our uh, I think it's very late for you there, isn't it? Now, what time is it over? And uh, it's seven o'clock. My wife and I've got to go out to dinner, so I have to get going. But you it's do that? Great. Yes. Brian and Hunter, and nice to speak to you. So thank you so much. Thank you man. so much. What a, what a pleasure. We appreciate it. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. Bye thank bye. you for having me on the show. No problem. It's our pleasure. Bye bye. Bye bye. Great guy. What a, what a fascinating guy. Uh, you know, thank you, Hunter Motts, once again. Hunter Motts <laughs> getting these heavy hitters, dude. That's exciting to talk to a guy like that. Yeah, man. absolutely. I mean, you know, what a great way to start your day. Eh? God, man. It's just, uh, yeah, it is. It's a great way to start your day. <laughs> and you just feel like you're hobnobbing. Like, now when I go to dinner, I can be like, oh, the rational optimist? I actually know him. I had, I've interviewed him. I, I had breakfast him. with him. I had some ideas for him, you know, really inspired him. That's right. <laughs> I made him laugh. <laughs> Uh, Matt Ridley was the guy. The book is The Rational Optimist. This has been another unbelievable uh, podcast with Brian Callen, Hunter Motts, soon to be the Callen Motts Extravaganza. No, 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 no. It's, it's... <laughs> we got to change the name. The Callen Motts Extravaganza. It's the Callen Motts Factor. <laughs> All right, we're out. Thank you. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show. Be sure to visit briancallen.com for information about this episode as well as past and future episodes. You can follow Brian on Twitter at Brian Callen and like him on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash briancallencomedy. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.